in order to classify um, our max, min, and saddle points, we've been using um, what the book calls Theorem 11. It's the second derivative test. So it says, suppose you've got some function, and its first and second partial derivatives are continuous um, in a region around some point a, b, and that f sub x and f sub y at that particular point a, b are both 0. In other words, if you've got a, you've got a, a function, and at some particular point the gradient is 0, right, that means that the tangent plane is going to be level for that function. And then <clears throat> what they're doing, if you look at it, they're saying if you calculate the determinant of that Hessian matrix, right, this is f sub x, x times f sub y, y minus f sub x, y squared. Um, this is the reason that they had to say that these had to be uh, continuous second partial derivatives is so that f sub x, y and f sub y, x would, would be guaranteed to be the same thing. So this really is calculating that Hessian determinant. If the Hessian determinant turns out to be positive, right, then you just look at f sub x, x. If, if this is positive, you know it has the same concavity in all directions. Looking at f sub x, x tells you that it's concave down along the x-axis, and therefore it's concave down everywhere, and you have a, lo you have a local, mi local maximum. On the other hand, if the, if the determinant of the Hessian matrix is positive, you know it has the same concavity in all directions. If f sub x, x is greater than 0, it's concave up along the x-axis, and therefore it's concave up in all directions, and so you have a local minimum. But if the Hessian matrix is negative, you know that it's concave up in some directions and concave down in others, so that you have a saddle point. And if the Hessian matrix turns out to be 0, the determinant of the Hessian matrix turns out to be 0, sometimes that's called the Hessian or the Hessian determinant, um, if that turns out to be 0, then um, the test is inconclusive. We can't tell. So it's interesting, but we still kind of have something that's a little bit unsatisfying because we don't know why it works. So we want to figure out why does this test work. And the answer takes a little while, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's working. With, it allows us to work with matrix, matrices, and that gives us kind of a, a, a leg up on your next class, which is going to involve solving differential equations and, um, and using some linear algebra, so working with matrices in order to do it. So, Okay, so the first part of the answer as to why it works has to do with the second order Taylor polynomial. Now we said, um, just in Calc 1, the reason the second derivative test works is because the second order Taylor polynomial would be f at your critical value, right? plus f prime at the critical value at the critical value times x minus the critical value plus one half f double prime at the critical value times x minus the critical value squared. Okay, and if you were at a place where the first derivative was zero, then this term is gone. And so to second order your function is basically this quadratic polynomial. And um, if f double prime is positive, you know you have a parabola that opens up. And if f double prime is negative, you know you have a parabola that opens down. And if f double prime is 0, you'd have to go to the third order Taylor polynomial to get more information about what's going on, because this term would disappear. So the test would be inconclusive. Now, if we think about functions that have two variables, then the second order Taylor polynomial looks like this. You find your critical point, right? And so you could do the Taylor polynomial centered at that critical point. You'd have f at the critical point. Plus now we have the total derivative matrix, right? Evaluated at the critical point, x, c, y, c, times um, we would have our vector here of x minus x, c, y minus y, c, multiplying that matrix. So this is. This is the derivative matrix, right, times the change in x and the change in y. And then the next term would, term would look like this. There would be a 1 half. And then we'd have this row matrix that has x minus xc and y minus yc. And then we'd have our, our second derivative matrix. So I'll just call that, uh, I'll just call it d2f right now. So that's a, but in this case, it's a 2 by 2 matrix. And then we would have this, so x minus xc and y minus yc. So basically, we have something that looks like if we look at being at a critical value, we know that the, this, is, uh, this is really the gradient of f, right, dotted with the vector of changes in input. And if we're at a critical value, we know that the gradient of f is the zero vector, right, and so this dot product turns out to be 
um, since this is the vector of all zeros, this, the result of this multiplication turns out to be um, turns out to be zero. So this term is just gone because we're at a critical point, and so we're really down to something that looks like this. We've got this positive number one half times we have a vector that's been transposed, so we'll say v transpose. We have a matrix, and so I'll just use a lot of times capital A as a common name for matrix. We have this matrix, and this is a nice symmetric matrix times um, another vector. This kind of form where we have we have a vector and it's transpose and they're multiplying some square matrix, some square symmetric matrix like this is called a quadratic form. And what this function does depends on uh, what the matrix A is like. So that's the first part of the question. The first part of the answer is that um, the most important thing, if you're, if you're at a critical point, um, this term is zero. So the next most important term in the Taylor polynomial has to do with that Hessian matrix. And it's all about what does a function like this look like. So if, if V has your input variables and you have some matrix of constants here, and there's your, your matrix V with your input variables again, what does this look like? And the answer tells us why the second derivative test works. Okay, so understanding a quadratic form involves knowing something about matrices. Now, matrices, <clears throat> um, instead of working on a single number, right, matrices work on a list of numbers. So. If you have a matrix, then you can make a function by multiplying that matrix times a vector. So in our case, we're thinking about a 2 by 2 matrix, right? So this matrix A makes a function that starts with two numbers and ends with two different numbers. Or you could think it starts with a vector in, um, in two-dimensional space and creates a new vector, AV, in two-dimensional space. And so this is the first part of understanding what V transpose AV does. It's just understanding what AV does. Now, <clears throat> when you have a matrix, let's say we have this matrix um, 1, 2, 2, 1. Every matrix has its own sort of pet directions or directions that it thinks of as special. So for most directions, like if I take maybe 1, 3, times this matrix, I'll get, let's see, I'll get a new vector. What will I get? 1 plus 6 is 7, and 2 plus 3 is 5. So I, I get a new vector. This vector is not only longer, but also points in a different direction. So we started off with this vector that went over 1 and up 1, 2, 3. So this was our input, right? And now we look at our output. Our output is this vector that goes over 7, but only up 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The vector got longer, so it changed its length, but it also changed its direction. So that's what happens to most vectors. Their length and their direction change when they're multiplied by a matrix. But certain directions, this matrix treats with sort of special treatment. Notice what happens if I use the vector 1, 1. This is a, this is a direction that just happens to be special to this particular matrix. When I do it, let's see, we get the vector 1 plus 2 is 3, and 2 plus 1 is 3. So we get the vector 3, 3. Notice that the direction didn't change because the vector 3, 3 is just the scalar 3 times the vector 1, 1. So we had that we start off with this vector 1, 1, right? And then we multiplied by this matrix and we got the vector 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so in this case, the direction didn't change, only the length. This this matrix happens to have um, another special direction, a direction that it likes. Um, 
if you multiply it by 1, negative 1. And let's see, you get 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And um, you get 2 minus 1 is positive 1. And you notice what happened was just the original vector got multiplied by a scalar. Right? So we started off with the vector 1, negative 1. We ended up with just negative 1 times our original vector. So again, we had this vector 1, negative 1. Just going down like this, right? And in this case, it just reversed the direction. Okay, so, so this is telling us that um, our matrix kind of treats certain, most directions, it both stretches and changes, right, the, stretches and changes the input vector. But in certain directions, um, our matrix sort of prefers those directions, and what it does is very simple. It just takes those directions and multiplies them by some scalar. If you have anything else in that same direction, let's say I had 1, 2, 2, 1, and instead of 1, 1, I had 5, 5, then we're still going to get the same thing. Watch what happens. We get 5 plus 10 is 15, and 10 plus 5 is 15. So we got basically 3 times um, our original vector, which was 5, 5. Notice that these lay in the same direction. We got the same stretching factor here. So if you were to do any vector that lay in the same direction as this so that these had just opposite values, you would find that um, that that direction just gets multiplied by the same value, negative 1. So these two directions are, um, are sort of special to the matrix. They belong to it. And so we call them eigendirections. Or if you have a, a, a particular vector in that direction, then we call that an eigenvector. So it's a, it's a vector that, is, that belongs to or is something special about that matrix. OK, so and also we have then associated with each eigendirection or eigenvector, we have an eigenvalue. So this matrix has, has two eigendirections, right? And then it has two eigenvalues. In one direction, things get stretched by 3. In the other direction, things just get multiplied by that scalar, negative 1. And this actually helps us to understand what the matrix does. So what we'll do now is figure out, OK, how do you find the eigenvalues of, ma of the matrix? And how do you use those eigenvalues to understand what the matrix is actually doing?